Hi, I'm John Atak. Um, this is a paper that I delivered at a conference in Denmark uh, in 2013, so oh, very nearly 10 years ago. I think it's one of the more important things that I've I've done over the years. It's called Scientology, the Church of Hate. An antisocial religion emerges in the space age. And the second part of the title is a little bit of a joke about a Scientology publication, uh, uh, a religion emerging in the space age. Let's start with the Ron Hubbard quotation. We are the only people on Earth with the right to punish. People attack Scientology. I never forget it, always even the score. There are, actually the numbers have gone down since I wrote this, there are about 20,000, 25,000 paid up Scientologists in the world, members of the International Association of Scientology. I doubt there have ever been more than 50,000. It's remarkable that such a small group has cast such a long shadow and in the process blotted out so much light. The mighty Internal Revenue Service assigned over a thousand agents to collect Scientology's back taxes, but in the end, the diminutive cult beat the IRS into pronouncing it a religion. The US State Department tamely followed suit. The IRS deciding the group is a religion is rather like a bus driver performing brain surgery. I doubt that the IRS employs even a single theologian. Constitution forbids interference in belief, so no US government agency can make such a decision anyway. But the IRS got carried away, perhaps because Ron Hubbard's infamous tactic to find dirt on critics was successful. Oh, you can find a conversation I had with Mike Rinder on the topic of the, the IRS, which Spike will usefully put a link to. Scientology's intelligence agency, the Guardian's office, became notorious when 11 executives, including Hubbard's wife, were imprisoned in the US. The former FBI head of station in Los Angeles said, in my opinion, the Church of Scientology has one of the most effective intelligence operations in the US, rivaling even that of the FBI. Hubbard's Operation Snow White, or the Snow White Program, was the largest ever clandestine attack upon the US government. In the 1990s, a district attorney who should have prosecuted the unlawful killing of Lisa McPherson, admitted that the prosecution was dropped because he didn't want anyone to poke through his trash and discover how much scotch he drank. Did Fred Goldberg of the IRS succumb to blackmail, or was he simply exhausted? He so far avoided many attempts to subpoena him to frankly address that question. As part of the secret deal, the IRS admitted that all of Hubbard's ramblings were scriptural, this includes his directive to mix up papers before sending them to the IRS. Maybe other citizens will adopt this tenet. Hubbard also ordered his followers to mow down the IRS, and this too is a protected religious teaching. The IRS may have legitimised more than they can easily chew. The IRS ignored the hundreds of millions that had geezered into Hubbard's accounts. He died with an alleged $648 million unspent. Every last cent derived from Scientology. With Hubbard no longer funneling money into his private bank accounts, the IRS decided that Scientology was no longer run for profit and took a mere $12.5 million in back taxes. I agree entirely with Professor Kent's assessment of the religious character of Scientology. Hard evidence shows that it is not a legitimate religion simply an antisocial organisation with a religious facade. But out of respect for the IRS, let us pretend that Scientology is a religion. It is clear that a positive social agenda is unnecessary for religious status in the US. In 1993, Scientology became a non-profit. In the UK, this would be a charity. I'm a tad old fashioned. I think a charity should be charitable. And charity is at the heart of all mainstream religions. St. Paul assures us that we are nothing if we have not charity. To the Buddhist, the Christian caritas, caring for another without want of reward, is an essential teaching. Muslims believe that the giver should be grateful to the beggar, not the other way around. Jews, Jains, Zoroastrians and Hindus 
all teach charity as a principal virtue. Only Satanism and Scientology do not. Indeed, Hubbard counsels that we should do nothing for charity because an exact exchange must be given for anything we receive. Both giver and receiver are tainted by the transaction. This is scriptural to Scientologists, an absolute truth that cannot be contested. Nor should we offer our sympathy, because sympathy is a low emotional tone. Hubbard taught that it weakens others if we respond to their distress. To this, and that we are all entirely responsible for whatever happens to us, according to the overt motivator sequence, Scientology's version of Karma Vipaka. In Scientology, there is no such thing as a free lunch, or indeed a free anything, which does not lead rapidly to payment that expands exponentially into thousands of dollars a day for processing. Religions receive charitable status because they work for the benefit of society, Charities can be educational or can offer material help to the victims of tragedy. Yet, Scientology seeks to educate people only into its own beliefs. And the very word victim is a cuss word to Hubbard. Members believe that every event is the consequence of past actions. So victims have pulled it in. There are no accidents. Events only occur in response to the wishes or postulates of the individual. Non-believers are regarded as raw meat, dead in the head, wogs. Hubbard heard the word wog in England, where it means the same as the N-word, but is applied to anyone who is not thoroughly white. In the UK, it has been a forbidden word since the 1970s, but that did not stop Hubbard from expressing his contempt for anyone unfortunate enough not to believe in him. The non-Scientologist is a wog who is dead in the head because devoid of spiritual understanding, no matter what their belief, and raw meat because to Hubbard, this is all any pre-Scientologist can possibly be. Hubbard is the only source of spiritual understanding. He pays occasional lip service to mainstream religions, but none any longer has value because, to quote him, Scientology is the only workable system man has and, in 50,000 years of history on this planet alone, man never evolved a workable system. Indeed, although claiming to be eclectic, on the secret upper levels, believers are told that Jesus is a fabrication implanted 75 million years ago by the evil Prince Zenu. As Hubbard put it, God is just the trick of this universe. All other beliefs have failed and lead their followers in the wrong direction. Only Scientology is true. The tolerance towards other faiths that has crept into the mainstream religions is absent from Scientology. Those of us who have tasted, tried, and spat out Scientology are even more harshly regarded than ordinary wogs. We are, quite simply, suppressive people, or antisocial personalities, or as a friend of mine put it, wog reverts. In conventional terms, we are entirely destructive, according to the scripture of Scientology. There is a glut of Hubbard teachings about those who criticise his opinions. They are to be harassed. Also among the scriptures of Scientology are the directives given to the infamous Guardian's Office, which transformed into the Office of Special Affairs after those 11 executives were imprisoned. Guardian's Office Branch 1, covert intelligence staff, moved quietly over into the Office of Special Affairs. Hubbard's Guardian's Office scripture, as it relates to harassment, remains in force. Indeed, the 800-page training pack for agents was republished in around about 1990, and the only change in the whole pack, and it includes breaking and entering, how to lie effectively, things of this kind, the only change in the pack was on the title page where Guardian's office was replaced with Office of Special Affairs. This is concealed from the broad membership, issued on a need-to-know basis to those who perform the dirty tricks. Hubbard's followers will point to his soothing statements about tolerance, friendship and harmony. 
but it's telling that he offered these publicly while instructing his intelligence agency in very different terms. This is glaringly obvious in the four policy letters called Attacks on Scientology. Written within a few days of one another, immediately after Lord Balneal asked the UK Health Minister for an inquiry into Scientology. This was in uh, February 1965. The policy letter addressed to the broad public and so available to WOGs and government inquiries says that when attacked, the proper response is simply to advocate total freedom. Another, for a far more limited audience, says one, spot who is attacking us. Two, start investigating them promptly for felonies or worse, using our own professionals, not outside agencies. Three, double curve our reply by saying we welcome an investigation of them. Four, start feeding lurid, blood, sex, crime, actual evidence on the attackers to the press. In one version, Hubbard speaks of the IRS and their masters, the Sykes, and slaves, the press. He soon appended, investigating noisily the attackers to this scripture. Noisy investigation remains a core policy of Scientology. Friends, relatives and colleagues are told that the perceived enemy is being investigated for criminal activities. Intelligence staff are precisely drilled in the technique of spreading rumours to discredit such enemies. Hubbard hired three private detectives to investigate every psychiatrist in Britain, as psychiatry is supposedly at the centre of the attack on Scientology. Lord Balneal, who had proposed the inquiry, topped the list. In 1967, Hubbard boasted his use of professional intelligence agents to investigate opponents, including the British Prime Minister. This is in uh, Ron's journal 1967, which was broadly issued. Hubbard issued many harassment orders, including Operation Funnybone to destroy the livelihood of a cartoonist simply because he'd mentioned Scientology, and Operation Freakout, which framed journalist Paulette Cooper for a terrorist bomb threat. Um, you can read about that in uh, Tony Ortega's uh, wonderful Unbreakable Miss Lovely. Harassment is not restricted to the secret intelligence section. All Scientologists at some time have to fulfil a liability formula, which entreats them to deliver an effective blow to the enemies of the group despite personal danger. The follower wants to imitate the leader. Christians want to imitate Jesus of Nazareth. Buddhists, Gautama Siddhartha. For a Muslim, the blessed prophet is the role model. The Scientologist wants to imitate Hubbard, though most have no clue about his true nature. He grossly exaggerated his own biography, turning the unusual into the exceptional, even the miraculous, in his claims about himself. Should society encourage us to model ourselves on a narcissistic sociopath, a fiercely angry bully, a multiple drug abuser, a wife beater and home abortionist? The answer is simple when the question is put this way. But Scientologists are ignorant of the reality behind Hubbard's torrent of deceptive self-adulation. His secret directives are full of loathing and they remain very privately in force behind the public facade. No Scientologist can ever cancel them because no Scientologist has allowed that right by policy. It would be a high crime. In the UK inquiry, Sir John Foster based his opinion squarely upon Hubbard's own teachings. He concluded, The reactions of individuals and groups to criticism varies from grateful acceptance or amused tolerance at one end of the scale to a sense of outrage and vindictive counterattack on the other. Scientology falls at the hypersensitive end of the scale. This would seem to have its origin in a personality trait of Mr Hubbard, whose attitude to critics is one of extreme hostility. And so, the Scientologist comes to see the whole world and everyone in it as a potential enemy, a potential trouble source. The Christian laments the sinful behaviour of heathens and offers prayers for their salvation but the Scientologist actively undermines society in the urge to eliminate any criticism of rigidly held beliefs. Judge Breckenridge summed up Scientology by saying, this was in 1984 in the first 
Jerry Armstrong case. The organisation clearly is schizophrenic and paranoid, and this bizarre combination seems to be a reflection of its founder, LRH. The evidence portrays a man who has been virtually a pathological liar when it comes to his history, background and achievements. The writings and documents in evidence additionally reflect his egoism, greed, avarice, lust for power and vindictiveness and aggressiveness against persons perceived by him to be disloyal or hostile. By schizophrenic, the judge meant a divided personality, a common misconception of the term, um, by turns, as he said, charismatic and vindictive. This dual nature runs throughout Scientology. Hubbard expected his followers to be fanatical. Never let them be half-minded about being Scientologists. Not one namby-pamby bunch of panty-waist dilettantes have ever made anything. When Mrs. Patty Cake comes to us to be taught, turn that wandering doubt in her eye into a fixed, dedicated glare, and she'll win. The proper instruction attitude is, we'd rather have you dead than capable. As to social values, Hubbard clearly states that non-Scientologists, WOGs, should have no voting rights because all are below zero on the tone scale. As spirits or thetans, all WOGs are actually dead. Only their raw meat bodies are alive. Hubbard aired toward benevolent dictatorship and nominated himself for the role. I'd be pleased if anybody watching can name me a benevolent dictator. I'm, I'm eager to have a list of benevolent dictators. It doesn't seem very likely. And I can't imagine it's happened very frequently. And L. Ron Herbert as dictator would have been a catastrophe as all those who served to him eventually found out. But the world would be a miserable place if it were run by the Sea Organization. Jerry Armstrong points out the actual emotional tone level of the pseudo-military sea organisation is fear. An Estonian tricked into taking a Scientology course explained that sea org members behave in a manner that's like Stalinism, because under Stalin, you would say one thing while doing a second and thinking yet a third. And he was thrown out for making that observation. This is an exact observation of the abundantly stressful lives of sea org members who live in slavery and can only dream of the supposed freedom that they sell. David Miscavige paid over $10 million to have his leadership rival, Pat Broker, who was appointed by Hubbard as his successor, watched around the clock by two investigators for 24 years. 24 years. This money was tax exempt because it was used for religious purposes. In 1966, Hubbard created the Guardian's office. And in fact, I think I gave the wrong date earlier. I think attacks on Scientology were, the, the policy letters were published in February 1966, not 1965. Branch One, the Department of Harassment, thrived for 16 years under his direction. The 800-page training manual is a scandalous compilation of harassment techniques, many derived from the confessions of former military intelligence agents. Uh, he recommends a couple of books by such people, uh, Black Boomerang uh, being one of them by Sefton Delmer. Operatives are taught how to lie and how to break and enter, among other scriptural requirements. This material was kept strictly sequestered from rank and file members like myself. We were told that among the aims of Scientology was a civilization without insanity, without criminals and without war, where the able can prosper. Hubbard favoured statistical management, and every week, Branch One reported 10 statistics, including an enemy or potential enemy removed from the position of power from which he is attacking or could attack. This garnered 250 points per enemy. The intelligence department's task is depopularising the enemy to a point of total obliteration, while public Scientologists are told in What is Greatness that the hardest task one can have is to continue to love one's fellows despite all reasons he should not. In the very month that this advice was promulgated, Hubbard created the Guardian's office to show that he was no longer going to love his fellows. In the infamous fair game law, 
Hubbard insists that opponents can be conned, deceived, litigated against, and even destroyed. Remarkably, since Hubbard's death, fair game has been defended as not just a religious doctrine, but a religious expression long after the pretended cancellation. Indeed, Hubbard issued a fatwa to all Scientologists saying that named individuals should be shot dead with process R245. Such contradictions form the backbone of Scientology. Hubbard had realised that contradiction causes hypnotic dependence, as he pointed out in his false data stripping policy. Scientology is a two-faced religion, if it is a religion at all, with Hubbard as its Janus. There have been other antisocial forms of religion. In India for centuries, the Thuggees murdered innocents in devotion to Kali. Modern-day Nigerian Christians expel and even murder infants. And I've put Christians in inverted commas there, believing them to be witches. Before creating Scientology, Hubbard was absorbed by beliefs and magical practices of Alistair Crowley. He recommended a Crowley text to his followers and referred to the great beast as his very good friend. In Hubbard's private papers, there are magical rituals and comments which show that he was privately devoted to the goddess Hathor, who has two aspects. She is pictured as a cow which feeds humanity, but she is also a devouring goddess who, like Kali, feasts on human blood. This essential contradiction runs through Scientology, making it a psychological or spiritual equivalent of the Thuggies. Told that his son Quentin had died, Hubbard grumbled at the inevitable bad publicity. Followers must sever all connections with anyone, friend, parent, sibling or child, when ordered so to do. Thousands of marriages have been torn apart through this antisocial policy. Hubbard's justification for this, and indeed for everything, is Scientology is a science of life. It is the one thing senior to life because it handles all the factors of life. This would doubtless apply to the use of deadly force to silence his opponents, as his R245 orders show. R245 is a coded expression for murder. Originally, routine two, number 45, and he demonstrated it by firing a shot from a Colt 45 in a lecture. And I think 1954, the book Creation of Human Ability, it contains R245. Scientologists are directed by Hubbard to tell an acceptable truth. In the intelligence department, they are also drilled until they can lie without detection, training routine lying, TRL. Scientologists will point to the many groups established by the Guardian's office to enrich society. They will show videos of Scientologists picking through the rubble at Ground Zero or helping out after the tsunami in T-shirts emblazoned with Scientology advertising. These groups really exist to promote Scientology. According to Hubbard, perfect public relations is good works, well publicised, which is a management statistic reported weekly by every Scientology organisation. Good work without a publicity angle is discouraged as inadequate PR. Germany recognises that the Scientologists' loyalties to their organisation prohibit them from loyalty to the state, so they cannot work in the civil service. Given the many covert operations run by Scientologists and the deliberate policy of getting a job next to power, this is no surprise. President Clinton tried to persuade European countries to join in the US protest at this, which is odd, as the convictions in the US show that Scientologists will readily betray their employers to further the ends of the cult. Indeed, as Guardian's office staff admitted, a policeman in the US accessed FBI computers to prevent the apprehension of Scientologists who had committed significant crimes. Scientologists are taught to feel contempt toward non-members, but to pretend friendly interest. This is called finding the reality. They concentrate on agreeable subjects, avoiding disagreement to prime the WOG for recruitment. Scientologists rehearse tens of scenarios in a series of precise drills until their proficiency is certified by a course supervisor and are tested on a simple lie detector to the examiner. And to anyone who protests me calling the e-meter a lie detector, 
There are two issues where Ron Hubbard called it a lie detector. Tone scale drills indoctrinate the ability to pretend an emotion so that the prospect can be manipulated down the scale, made to feel worse deliberately. A recruiting department policy letter explains that it specialises in human emotion and reaction, handling it, capturing it and controlling it. Recruiters find the ruin, which is whatever a prospect feels is ruining their life, their worst nightmare, their greatest fear. The next carefully practised step is to steer the prospect into the full gloom of this personal terror by causing fear of worsening. It is an aspect of Hubbard's contempt for humanity that he used practised emotional manipulation upon the the dead-in-the-head raw meat wogs. Once the area of ruin is found, whether it be sex, drugs or rock and roll, Scientology will be offered as the solution in return for an initially small fee. The recruiter receives 10 to 15 percent of future sales, so field staff members can make a very good living. Because, as a Scientology spokesman once said, the bridge to total freedom costs about the same as a car. He failed to add a Ferrari, that is. And you could probably buy several Ferraris for the cost of Scientology Bridge as it is now. Scientologists are taught to treat others as prey. Sales staff take the Registrar Sales Training Course based upon the textbook Big League Sales Closing Techniques by Les Dane, a hard selling manual to which Hubbard added his own scripts and drills to make the pitch seem heartfelt and genuine. Techniques are horrifying, but now constitute an aspect of the religious scripture. Of Scientology. The course even orders the use of secret microphones so other sales staff can listen in or the sales pitch can be recorded for later correction. This material goes into a prospect folder so future sales can be fine-tuned. Let's sell these people a piece of blue sky describes a 13-hour sales session where a loan shark arrived with the check already written. His name was Lee Lawrence, and it was a cheque for £7,000, as I recollect. I declined the loan, but many others did not. Many also gave up their homes and all they owned to become warriors in a pitched battle that never subsides. After spending everything, many joined staff with a 90-hour week, awful food and lodgings, and an hour a day at most with their own children. Women who fall pregnant are offered the choice of termination or demotion being sent to an outer organisation, away from headquarters. And while the leader lives like an oriental prince, the pay is barely enough to buy the cigarettes, which almost all staff smoke. Guinness Book of World Records lists Ron Hubbard as the world's most prolific author, but Scientology should be added as the most prolific litigator in all history, having initiated literally thousands of lawsuits. Scientology has settled numerous suits with huge payments and a silence contract, which forces critics to remain forever silent, even about their own experience and even in private conversation. This is an absolute contradiction to the creed of the Church of Scientology, which asserts the inalienable right to free speech. A representative of a major TV news company recently told me that, as much as they would like to do a story about Scientology, their lawyers say it is too dangerous. How is it that an organisation that inspires such fear can be regarded by anyone as socially positive? Hubbard was named as an unindicted co-conspirator for his part in infiltrating government agencies in the US, false imprisonment and the theft of tens of thousands of documents. Federal agents were unable to penetrate Hubbard's security. He remained in hiding for the last decade of his life. The sentences for the 11 Scientologists who went to prison is a warning to those who want to grant Scientology privileges which should be reserved for socially beneficial groups. Sentencing two of Hubbard's deputies, the judge said, the crimes committed by these defendants is of a breadth and scope previously unheard. No building, office, desk or file was safe from their despicable scheming and warped minds. The tools of the trade were miniature transmitters, lockpicks and secret codes, forged credentials and any other devices they found necessary to carry out their heinous schemes. 
that was the um, Jane Kimber and Morris Budlong uh, sentencing. To this day, no single scriptural policy regarding harassment of perceived enemies has been changed. In summation, wherever authorities recognize the religious nature of Scientology, they also accept that a religion can be essentially antisocial. If that is so, then we can expect to see more socially destructive systems emerging and claiming tax exemption to the further detriment of society. In my own stand against Scientology, I have always supported freedom of belief, including freedom of belief in Scientology, of course. But when an organisation which is clearly antisocial is encouraged by incompetent or corrupt authorities, it's time to call a halt. If we are to have charities, then they must support the social good. If Scientology is a church, then it is a church of fear and hatred, and its policies should be decried. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this. And please contribute um, to our Patreon account or stick some money in the PayPal. It, it all really helps. Thanks a lot and have a fantastic 2023. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you'd click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.